Hi, I'm Ibi, and welcome to this episode of Kill the Cat. Today we're discussing Season 1 of the Marvel and Netflix series Jessica Jones. In this episode, we're going to be looking at who we consider to be one of the scariest of all the Marvel villains, Kilgrave, played by the amazing David Tennant. We'll be breaking down this mind-controlling sociopath to help you create original, terrifying, big baddies of your own. Warnings for this episode include discussions of sexual assault, abuse, and suicide, as well as major plot spoilers for Season 1. Now, enjoy the episode. Welcome back to Kill the Cat. So, today we are talking about Jessica Jones, and we're specifically unpacking how to create a terrifying villain. Why this episode, uh, I think on my end, um, when we started this podcast, we kind of came up with a list of episodes that we sort of wanted to get around to eventually. Those included our first ones around Harry Potter and the Nice Guys and Princess Bride. Um, But one of the ones I put on pretty early was like, Jessica Jones, How to Write a Terrifying Villain. Like I binged the show on the day it was released, not really knowing anything about it, just sort of seeing the trailer and being like, yeah, that looks cool in the morning. And then 13 hours later, I had finished. But the thing that stood out to me most was like, wow, Kilgrave is terrifying. Yeah. So context for anyone who hasn't seen the show. Uh, Kilgrave is played by the wonderful David Tennant. He does villain extremely well. Mm. Uh, He is a man with the power of mind control who doesn't really have any goals except what he wants now in the moment. Mm. Oh, that just made, that gave me chills just saying that out loud. (laughs) So the last villain we covered, MCU villain, was Thanos. Yeah. Very, very different villain. We talked about him having a holy quest and like he thinks he has this higher purpose. Kilgrave, no. Kilgrave just wants what he wants and he will hurt anyone to get it he doesn't want to be president he doesn't want no he doesn't He doesn't even really want like to be super rich he wants a quiet restaurant when he takes a girl out for a date yeah he wants at one point a character called trish calls him impotent over the radio mm. so he threatens her a man walks into him holding a cup of coffee and almost spills on his suit so he makes him throw the boiling coffee in his face yeah He's, it's that kind of stuff. Yeah. And we'll go into that a bit more later on. But the other thing I guess we should talk uh, define is like, what do we mean by a terrifying villain? Like, how do we define that? Yeah. So I actually struggled to like think of villains that made me properly scared. And what I would say is like a scary villain is someone you not only you wouldn't want to meet in real life, but you could imagine meeting in real life. Hmm. So the closest one I could think of to Kilgrave was actually Negan from The Walking Dead, who doesn't have superpowers, but has so much power in that context and is willing to use violence combined with manipulation of the people around him. Hmm. And we've all kind of had that, like maybe that boss or maybe that person in your family, maybe like me, you've worked a service job and had to be a waitress for a while or you you worked Hmm. in a call center yeah. Yeah. So I think we can all really imagine yeah. having those like domineering people that do at not mind control, but do have control over us and can sometimes even put us in compromising positions. Yeah. And I think amongst all the MCU, Kilgrave is more tangible threat as you watch the series in terms of how we react emotionally to it. The usual superhero threats, the things like superpowers or world ending events, you know, they're these things that are so removed from our reality that we can't really picture ourselves in the shoes of the victim. Thanos could snap us, but sudden disintegration doesn't really happen in real life. Look, it's 2020 and 2021 has just begun, so maybe it will be this year. Uh, look, maybe. <laughs> um, Who knows? I'm holding out hope for no sudden disintegration. But, you know, even villains like Ultron and Loki and uh, that, they're focused more on fighting the threats of the Avengers. Uh, And that tends to be pretty typical of movie villains, like movie and TV villains, where they're really pretty focused on a specific person or group. But Kilgrave, his victims aren't superheroes. They're everyday people. You don't get caught up in his mind control because you are you know, wronged him, you get caught up because you just happened to be the person who was there. Yeah. There's one minor character who talks about Kilgrave made him be his driver for a few days. 
That doesn't sound so bad until he tells you that in order to do that, he made him take his young son out of the car and leave him on the sidewalk. And now he has no custody of his kid. Yeah. Because Kilgrave needed a driver and that happened to be the closest person. Yeah. Kilgrave kind of treats all these things very much the same. And it's one of the ways in which the show is really well written. One of the ways in which David Tennant just beautifully portrays the role. They're but- almost, some of the, like, the most horrific lines he says is throwaway lines. Mm. I think like the biggest one is death by a thousand cuts. Here have it. So that is when he's telling um, a nurse to essentially murder her current wife and they're going through a divorce yeah. by cutting her a thousand times with a knife. Yeah. That sounds horrible, but literally he hands her the knife. He's on the way out the door as he says it. Mm. And you can just know by the way he does it, he's not going to think twice about that later. Yeah. Or, at all. you know, he tells Trish, like, put a bullet in your head. Mm. And she tries to shoot herself, but the gun's not loaded. So she, like, tries to eat the bullet. Uh, yeah. And again, in. he doesn't even look at her. He says it on the way out the door. Yeah. It's a throwaway line. And yeah. there, are, there are petty things that he does. Like, there's a guy who comes up to him in the street outside a club. Uh, in one of the later episodes, and he tells him, like, go across the road and stand there forever. He didn't even do- Did he bump into him or say something? I think um, there had been, like, Kilgrave had been testing out his powers in the club as, like, right. like getting up in front of everyone and, like, I don't know, telling them to dance or something like that, and everyone loved it. And this guy was like, oh, man, I loved, you know, what you did. That was so cool. But he was in the middle of talking to someone. Yeah. And so Kilgrave just sent him away. But then you come back, I think it's the next morning or it's like in the evening, hours later, and the guy's like pissed himself and he's still standing there. Yeah, and he's just crying because he can't move. Yeah. Or he like tells Hope to just stay in the bed. And she's there for like five hours before Jessica can come save her. Yeah. And he treats all of this the same. He doesn't get any pleasure out of this. He just literally does not consider Mm. consequences. And he doesn't take the blame. Yeah. He says outright, really casually... I've never killed anyone. After you've witnessed him, like, murder multiple people. Well, he made them murder themselves. Exactly. So it wasn't him, yeah. right? Or there's one where Jessica basically says, like, you, like, straight up, you raped me. And his response to that is like, oh, you know, I don't like that word. And when he's pressured more about that, he says he's the victim. And he has this whole logic around, well, I could never know if I was raping someone or if they wanted it or not. Because everyone just does what I said. Yeah, he says, and, how was I supposed to know? Yeah. That's so scary because like we hear that mm. often, especially like in the Me Too movement. There's so much of like, oh, how was I supposed to know? Like, she didn't say no. Yeah. Or we'd had a few drinks. Mm. How was I supposed to know this was assault? Yeah. So we hear a lot of that narrative mm. and to hear it reflected so casually by Kilgrave and that is his mindset. Yeah. Look, this season is not at all subtle with its social context mm. around like rape culture. I it's not it's, subtle, but it's not on the nose. And like it's you said, refreshingly, it's not preachy. Yeah. Yeah. It represents it. It feels very realistic. And mm. like part of that is having this very scary villain. And he doesn't feel like a cartoon character ever. He feels like someone who really could exist because he gets the mind control powers as a kid. Yeah. So he's had this power since he was, what, like about 10? I think it's 10. Yeah. To give a 10-year-old mind control powers, he's never going to learn what consequences are. Yeah. And how do you develop a conscience? Yeah. How did you, um, what was the phrase you used to describe him? Oh, he's the embodiment of the entitled rapist. Which is a very poignant description of him. It's interesting as as a guy, you know, there are things that I don't, think about when I, you know, go for a walk or go out at night, like, you know, being by myself isn't a concern. Like I'm working from home a fair bit at the moment. And like, if the front door's unlocked, I'm like, yeah, okay, cool. Like what's going to happen? That's not a kind of attitude that my wife has or our housemate has, or just about any woman in my life that I know has. And this series is kind of a tap into the kind of fear around like non-consent and loss of control and sexual assault uh as a guy this is a really good way to just get a little bit of a sense you know never as much of a sense i don't know am i yeah. is that is that something helpful to add to the yeah yeah definitely definitely a- um yeah i think one of the things they do really well is like one of the reasons like Kilgrave is very scary is you feel like he's everywhere 
or he could be everywhere because mm. it's not just him it's the people he can control yeah and yeah jessica gets very paranoid like because anyone in her life could be mind controlled and that gets pulled on her a couple of times where she thinks she's safe and i think mm. that's a nice embodiment of like like you said like for women like sexual assault is everywhere uh so one of the victims in this is jessica's foster sister trish who is wealthy she's famous she's white she lives in a high security apartment and she can fight mm. she's a victim Another one of them is Hogarth, who is an incredibly prominent lawyer. Again, rich. Very powerful. Incredibly character. powerful, rich. And again, white. She becomes a victim. So it's this idea that absolutely no one is safe. Hmm. Yeah. It's probably worth talking about this. Some of the practical elements of how they went around filming this show also add to sort of the terrifying nature of the villain. Um that's you know from the cinematography through to the um just the way in which he's revealed i like the way you said it there are like three phases of kilgrave and how we see him mm. and the first one is the monster off screen yeah so we don't see him in episode one we see him as a silhouette in episode two right at the end mm. um where we are in a scene with him but then jess sees him you know, through a window in episode three um, mm. when she he's up in the, like, penthouse apartment and she goes there. And he has that uh, moment with the police officer where he's like, okay, you can go. And the police officer goes to go out the door. He's like, not that way. And he points to, like, off the edge of the balcony. And the police officer's just like, okay. And goes to jump. I'm like, oh. Uh. Is that Simpson? That's Simpson. She yeah. saves him. Simpson's an interesting character. We can get into that maybe a yeah. bit later. I think we hear his voice over the radio talking to Trish before we see him in person. Yeah, that's yeah. episode three. He is revealed the way you would reveal a horror movie monster, right? Like in, mm. if you think back to like Alien. Or and Jaws. Some the, yeah, some of the old movies where it's like from a purely practical standpoint, they couldn't really show mm. the whole model of the monster because that would ruin the illusion. And so you had this sort of like silhouetted things, which ended up being more terrifying. And I think the other thing that really adds to the way he was revealed in the start is that we see in the first episode Jess as this highly competent, if not cynical and slightly alcoholic PI. Look, she's a we, mess. She's but... a mess, but she's a very competent <laughs> yeah. mess um, and who's got superpowers and who isn't really phased by this very dark, rough world around her. But then the moment there's a potential for Kilgrave and we like just get the idea of him. Like I think it's his, like she hears his name or something. She is just sent into this panic attack where she can barely function. Represented by like this awful slow motion. <laughs> I actually thought that was all right. I didn't, okay. I didn't, I didn't mind. mind it the first time I saw it. It's something about it this time around. Okay. Yeah. I, I was watching it this time around. I'm like, oh no, that was a good choice. Okay. But yeah. So um, she has panic attacks and she has to go through her like you know, Higgins Drive uh, and all the other streets, which is then a great reveal for the house later on. I love that. Yeah. You know, where it just cuts out to the street sign. I'm like, ah. And she wants to like just run off to Hong Kong. That's um, her first reaction. It's like, yeah. he's back. I'm going to Hong Kong. Yeah. I think we talked about this in one of our other episodes where reaction is so important. I think that was in comedy, but I mm. think it's in anything, right? Like one of the early screenwriting tips I got was have other characters tell us something about the character. So mm. Have characters tell us something about the villain or show us something about the villain rather than the villain telling us that about themselves. Because they're showing us how we should react because we're social creatures. Yeah. And when we come into like a new movie or TV show, it's it's a different world, whether it's fantasy mm. or not. And we're relearning how to behave. Yeah. And we're taught very early on, like, Kilgrave, run. Yeah. Don't go near him. We mirror that. Yeah. 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 So that's phase one. And that kind of goes for the first like four to six episodes. Yeah. And then I think the big change comes in the police station. Yeah. I still remember seeing the scene for the first time. This is legit one of the scariest scenes I've ever seen, which is we think the whole time that Kilgrave is out to kill Jessica as like a revenge thing or he just hates her. He's coming to kill her. And then the police station goes, what? No, I'm in love with you. It's worse. That's so much worse. That's so scary. Yeah. 
Like it's, this isn't guy who wants to murder you. This is stalker who wants to be with you. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. With mind control. He can't control Jessica, but we don't know that at this point. No. We still think he can mind control her. That yeah. hasn't been revealed yet. And the, even just the end of that scene, when he just walks out and he's like, you will all think this is a hilarious joke. And everyone's just laughing as just like, oh. That old thing of like, the police can't help you. Like, yeah. Jessica wouldn't go to the police anyway, but they're letting us know. Also, like, again, Will Simpson is a cop who ends up just making everything worse. So much worse. So much oh, worse. Will. He thinks he's Bruce Willis in Die Hard and he just comes in mm. and just every time he's on screen, it just gets steadily worse and worse. Yeah. Oh, Will. I actually forgot he was a character from the first time around. Oh, I, was, really? I was surprised when he showed back up on screen. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's a few characters who kind of, uh, like, I, I remembered him, but I don't think I remembered how much of a through line he had. Yeah. Like, I think I remembered a couple of moments and I remember him... Uh, you know, that he had the whole thing about taking the, whatever the drugs are. The, that he the steroid take. thing, yeah. Yeah, and that Trish at some point takes it as well. Mm. Yeah, I thought he was interesting as well because he starts off as the good guy. Mm. We think he is and we think he's on our side. Gets together with Trish and then yeah. slowly reveals himself to be violent and abusive yeah, in his own even, way yeah. because of the steroids. Yeah, I don't even know that he reveals himself. I think he becomes that. Yeah, yeah. which is another fear. Like, mm. oh, this one seems nice. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> you had a point about, like, the men in this show. Yeah. Um. So, like, Kilgrave and Will Simpson are, like, the two threats. But good men can't help is what I had. So probably, like, the most competent man in this is Luke Cage, who then gets his own TV show. Yeah. And um, we think he's going to be like an ally for Jessica, but really it just becomes another way to hurt her when Kilgrave gets a hold of him yeah. and makes them fight. I also forgot from the first time around, he, they have this really lovely scene on the rooftop. It's like, I'll forgive you every day if I need to, like whatever you need. And you're like, oh, they're in love. And then it's a reveal later that Kilgrave is controlling him and put those words mm. in his mouth. And that just felt so incredibly invasive. Yeah. Because it's this really, like, personal, this romantic moment. Private moments. Yeah. I, I mean, and that's a thing that happens uh, in the early parts. He's got Malcolm tailing mm. Jess and taking photos. And she, you know, I think it's episode three or four where she's, you know, Kilgrave has escaped and she finds this room that's just covered in photos of herself. Uh, yeah. There's a point where Kilgrave has been in her apartment and he kills Reuben. The, the making Jess send a photo to him every day at 10 a.m. Yeah. Like, oh, that's. And, and she has to be smiling. Yeah. She has to smile for him. Mm -hmm. That sounds like one of those things that would be really on the nose. Like the man telling the woman to smile, but it's so creepy and cringy. Every time. Every time. And then, like, in probably one of the most insane things he does he recreates her childhood home yeah from like photos from way back when and like gets all the details and all the furniture and the posters in the right place and it's yeah yeah and he sees this as the grand romantic gesture mm. which like hollywood and hallmark have taught us like if you do a big romantic gesture she'll like you there's also a scene he gets her like a really gaudy purple dress right. and actually i don't know if this was intentional i feel like it was it's that scene from beauty and the beast yeah. so bell is locked in her room and the beast just like come down to dinner she's like no and then eventually she puts on the nice dress and she goes to dinner because she has to eat because she's a prisoner it's the same scene as beauty and the beast it's Kilgrave. she doesn't put on the dress she shreds it and he makes her come to dinner yeah yeah so i thought that was like an interesting like dismantling of a very classic mm. fairy tale like, we all know fairy tales are full of problematic behaviour. That's well, not a fresh take. What are you talking take. about? Cat fairy tales <laughs> are so representative of Exactly how relationships should, should be. be. There is nothing, nothing wrong, wrong with old school Disney. Kiss all girls while they sleep. They like yeah. that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, so going back, I think we've kind of jumped in a little bit, but uh, the three phases of oh, Kill yes. Phase one is he's the monster off screen and what we're kind of touching on now, and this is the one that includes the episode where she's in her old house with him. Yeah. 
favorite episode, I think. Because it's just Kristen Ritter and David Tennant playing off each other in a contained location. It's not quite a bottle episode, but it's close. Yeah. And bottle episodes are always, I don't know, I always really like them. Mm. But then I think there's also just some really great character stuff that comes out in that. And yeah. you get to see, I think, the fullest version of their dynamic mm. that we get in the show. Like, you don't get another moment where they are just left. It's the together. closest they have to being on equal footing. Because mm. she has leverage over him. Yeah. Not as much as, like, so basically he's holding, like, two household staff hostage. Yeah. So she can't leave or they'll die. But he also wants her to, like, fall in love with him for real. Mm. And she's still, she thinks she's under the threat of being controlled by him. Yeah. But watching that scene back, I'm like, oh, we can't control her. There's also that really interesting scene where the neighbor comes over. Oh. And she's saying all that, like, horrible stuff about oh. Jessica. Yeah. And Kilgrave defends her honor a little bit mm. and says... She he makes There's her a lot admit of satisfaction from that like yeah and Jessica admits it she's like yeah that was really satisfying mm. I think that's the closest we get to like somewhat okay Kilgrave yeah yeah it's a little taste of maybe what he gets out mm. of like doing this and yeah. it is satisfying and and it begs us the question of like could he change. Like, mm. Is he, which, you know, is the, another one of the classic um, themes in, like, toxic relationships, right, and toxic sexual Yeah, like, can I oh, change him? Yeah, I can change him. And, you know, should I stay with him so I can change him? Yeah, she's debating. Basically, she takes him, like, into a hostage situation and makes them him, like, talk the hostage, take her down. Yeah. And not shoot himself in the face. Mm-hmm. I love when he oh. comes back in the house. He's like, I want cake. Yes. <laughs> I did one good thing. <laughs> I'm amazing. So yeah, and she even like goes to Trish and she's just like, I, I could stay with him and we could go do good things. Mm. She doesn't. She throws she doesn't. him in the cell. Yes. Good job, yes. Yes, good uh, job. <laughs> it's very satisfying. Mm. Which then leads to stage three Kilgrave. Yeah. Uh, which is after he gets out of the cell, he gives up on the idea of trying to naturally get Jess to love him and instead is like, okay, well, I'll just make myself more powerful. It's the rejected force. man. Yeah. Scary. Yeah. <laughs> scary, scary. I will force you to love me. I will force you to love me or I will kill you. Yeah. I think well, there's a line he's like, I haven't decided yet. I will do one. Or maybe I'll reject her, then kill her. Mm. I mean, there's a bit at the end where he he thinks he can control her again and she, he's like, it's okay. Eventually, like, you will love me. Yeah. Um, and, like, that's what Hollywood teaches us. Like, there's always, like, the nerdy guy who becomes a hero and gets the girl at the end. Mm. And it's like, so I really think that's Kilgrove's mindset. Mm. As soon as she sees the real me. He goes on a bit as well. Like, he's having, like, a rant. He has this whole thing of, like, I love this girl. Oh, she rejected me? Oh, she's a bitch. Yeah. And he goes to extremes of, like, I'm going to kill her. But, again, we see that all the time in Tinder screenshots of, like, you're so pretty, not interested, bitch. Yeah. You're fat. Like, yeah. We see that all the time. And like, yeah. What, just calm down. Calm down. Be like Malcolm. Yeah. Malcolm's so nice. I love I Malcolm. A lot. Oh, that reveal of like, because he's working for Kilgrave and we learn that. Mm. But then the reveal of like, he's the person Jessica was saving when Kilgrave like mind controlled her. He's the person oh, getting beat right. up in the alley. Yes. So he goes after him because he's like, you're not a hero, Jessica. This is the thing like, Jessica's struggling with the whole Mm. thing of like, am I a hero? Do I want to be a hero? Because, I mean, her backstory is that she did time as, oh, what was it? Jewel? Jewel, I think. I don't think she ever went under. In the comics, it's Jewel. Yeah. Trish tries to like get her the outfit and get her to call herself Jewel. But we see like that naive thing of like, oh, I have superpowers. I'm going to be a superhero. So I believe this takes place shortly after the Battle of New York. Yeah. So the Avengers are now a thing. So I think that's where she's coming from. Like, maybe I can do this. Yeah. Not like them, but like I can go out on the streets and I can fight crime. She does. She saves a man from getting beaten up. And because she does that heroic act, one, she gets mind controlled by Kilgrave because he sees that. He's Mm. like, you're amazing. I have to have you. And then later she finds out he goes after the man she saved. Yeah. And maybe makes life worse for him because she saved him. Yeah, well, he's like gets him addicted to drugs and mm. like and he, puts his life yeah. in shambles to keep him coming back and 
Yeah. Like, he's a bright, genuinely kind yeah. man. Like, probably the last human who deserves that. Yeah, and, and, like, none of the victims deserve what they get from Kilgrave. Yeah, um, and he doesn't give them a second thought. No. Although that does go into, like, our nice next point, mm. um, which is, yes, he's mind-controlling Malcolm, but not always, because he gets him hooked on the drugs enough, because yeah. his limit starts off as 12 hours. Yeah. He tries to expand that later. When he's in, like, the third phase of, like, megalomaniac Kilgrave a little bit. Of just this person who's just getting more and more powerful. Yeah. Once he escapes the cell, his yeah. whole mission is to basically become powerful enough that he can mind control Jess. Yes. That's his end goal. So he gets Malcolm addicted to drugs. So when his 12 hours wears off, he'll still come back to him and help him because Kilgrave becomes his supplier. Yeah. And there's like a few things like that where it's not always mind control. Mm. He's crafty in other ways. Yeah, and I had a point about, like, he's actually quite competent even without his powers. Like, mm. there's a part of Kilgrave that is very, like, um, you know, he's purely ex- instinctual and he, like, kind of just acts off his every whim, right? Like, he wants a cafe to be quieter. He just yells everyone to shut up. Um, you know, he someone bumps into him with coffee. He says, throw it in your face and just mm. keeps walking. Um, but there is also a part of him that's very like conniving and very thoughtful and very methodical about how he approaches things, right? Like the whole, um, what he does to Jess throughout the season from everything from using Malcolm, who was the guy that she was saving and her neighbor through to messing with Trish and like getting hope in there and the way he treats hope. Jessica can't kill him because basically he goes after another girl called Hope and she gets and makes her murder her parents. Mm. This is like the first big Kilgrave act we see and he's not even there. Uh, terrifying villains. Um, so what Jessica is trying to do is bring in Kilgrave and prove that he has mind control yeah. so Hope doesn't get sent to prison for the rest of her life. Yeah. Which is like a really nice tidy reason of like, why don't you just kill him? Like with mm. the sniper rifle from a distance. It's no, because there's this girl literally called Hope. We can't kill Hope. Yeah. That sounds really corny, but I think they save it because I think Kilgrave picked her because her name was Hope. And he's taking away Jessica's Hope. And in the end, Hope ends up killing herself. Yeah. So that Jess doesn't have that reason to stop her. Hope is another really interesting character. I was saying before, when I, I remember her, but I kind of remember her even more as like a victim. And I was mm. actually surprised... This time around, she really, like, like, she wasn't crying and being like, Jessica, help me. She's very practical. Yeah. And very, like, okay, this has happened. This is my life. I'm going to try and make the best possible decisions, mm. whether that's confessing to this or having someone beat me up in prison, essentially so I lose the baby. Yeah. She was mm. more interesting. And and she's played by Erin Moriarty, who became Starlight in The Boys. I was like, where did I know that actress it's from? I'm like, hmm, I know her. Yeah, she's Starlight. There you go. Ah. Yeah, so you, Kilgrave, uh, one of the other things he does, when he's locked in the chamber, mm. he still manages to outwit and deceive Hogarth, someone who's whole. Mm. Probably the smartest power. character in the show. Yeah, like yeah. all her power is from outwitting and deceiving people and manipulating people. Like that's how she is who she is. And Kilgrave is able to do that without the use of his powers. He just sees what she wants and goes through it. I also think it's really interesting that what Hogarth wants is also essentially sex. So the context for that is she's divorcing her wife because she's fallen in love with her secretary. But the secretary won't have sex with her until they're married. Yeah. It's a whole thing of like sex is danger in this show. Mm. Like every sexual encounter has consequences of some kind. Yeah. Look, this is a genre called neo-noir, which is like film noir, but for the modern times. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really fun bits and pieces it takes from noir. It takes the voiceover. It takes the jazz music. And it takes the idea that, yeah, like sex is dangerous. And that doesn't just mean rape. It means, like, I think Jessica and Luke have a really interesting relationship where they both have super strength. Yeah. Um, so their sex literally, like, tears apart a room and then later makes Luke a target for Kilgrave. Yeah. Hogarth, like I said, 
secretary's using sex against her. She's having an affair. Even Ruben, who's her neighbor, who is into Jessica in a very innocent way. But also still somewhat creepy way. Still so, uh, yeah, I had him like, Ruben is harmless, but still unwanted male attention. Mm. Um, he dies for that. Like Kilgrave yeah. kills him for that. Um, Hope gets pregnant. Oh, and then I also had, we haven't gone into this because I don't think it's as relevant, but Trish and Jessica's mother, uh, they literally oh. say that Trish's mother pimped her out when she was a child. No. It wasn't outrightly sex, but it was very like, you are going to starve. Your, I'm going to stick my fingers down your throat until you throw up so you're skinny enough. Mm-hmm. And I'm, yeah, literally, I'm going to pimp you out to like the media, essentially, to make me money. Oh, um, her mother's a piece of work. Trish as well, like her sexual encounter with mm, Simpson, Will yeah. Simpson is, again, another one of those, those things that puts her in a lot of danger and, you know, exposes her to... I mean, he just gets worse and then she ends up... Yeah, there's a subplot of, like, Simpson on steroids. But yeah. that seems, like, really, like, nice when they start off. You're like, ah, oh, like, love interest. Mm. And he the, he gets hurt and they have to call in a doctor who starts giving him steroids. Yeah. And then he becomes abusive and violent. Yeah. And believes he's, like, protecting Trish. I think he locks her up somewhere at some point. Yeah, I think he locks her up so that she can't help Jess because Jess is going to try and capture Kilgrave and not, mm, yeah. and he wants to just go kill him. I think it, it, Simpson's actually a really good example of what I think is like probably my last point, but is Kilgrave is kind of the perfect villain for everyone in the series. Um, when you look at Simpson, this is a guy who is highly capable, is very well trained, and yes, he's got the military background and he's done those steroids before, but actually he decided to be a cop so he could mm. help people. He just wanted to be a good cop. And then he got used by Kilgrave and thinks he had killed Trish. And that one sort of thing sends him on this spiral into using the steroids and becoming this just really toxic person. Uh, when you look at Trish, I think you mentioned this before, but like she lives in a fortress and she's highly trained as a combatant um she's rich she's wealthy but she still can't keep safe from him um, yeah i think in their first fight it's like her jessica and will and she goes down in maybe like 10 seconds and she's devastated because she's her point is like literally what else could i have done and the yeah. answer is nothing mm. with hogarth kilgrave is able to get through sort of her deception and so she's powerless against him and kilgrave uses her to his advantage uh luke impenetrable body but still able to be mind controlled yeah so i had like i wrote this down it's like not just a terrifying villain for the audience but a terrifying villain specifically for this hero which is jessica so it's established really early on that independence is everything to jessica um she could go work for hogarth and like make a lot more money than she is but she likes freelance she has no ties because she wants to be completely in control of her life She's unfazed by everything. She feels like she's invulnerable. And then she has an ongoing like internal battle of whether she's a terrible person or whether she's a hero. Mm. Or maybe there's a balance there. And look, she does a lot of questionable things. Mm. Oh, and yeah, going back to that sex is danger thing. Like she doesn't mean to sleep with Luke, but she's... I think this is amazing because we don't want goody two-shoes characters. We want characters with depth. But she is stalking Luke... Because Kilgrave made Jessica kill his wife. Yeah. And then she sleeps with him and doesn't tell him. Oh. <laughs> yeah. That's a... But unlike Kilgrave, she feels bad about it. Yeah. And Kilgrave's whole thing with her is like, you're not a hero. It's like, you're a terrible person. I can make you better. Mm. Which plays straight into like gaslighting and abusive relationships. Yeah. Um, he tries to play that off her. Like, she is a hero. Like, anywhere Kilgrave goes... He basically has hostages whenever there's people because he can mind control. And Mm. Jessica won't allow that collateral damage. Yeah. Until the end, which is super interesting. Yeah. Like, she doesn't mean for Hope to die, but the only way she gets to beat Kilgrave is when Hope kills herself. And then she has to let him... And that's a decision that Hope has to make. Yes. Jessica will never make that decision. And Hope realizes that. And so chooses to take her life. And then Jessica essentially has to let him walk away with Trish and threaten to rape her and has to pretend 
There's a moment when they almost get on the boat. Yeah. And like, I honestly don't think you can call, like, does Jessica break her act and go after her in that moment? Or does she let them walk away? And I think she was wanting to let them walk away. Yeah. Some people might come back at me of that, but I think she might. She might have been. That last moment, you know, second watch through, you know what's happening yeah. and what's coming. And it's still entertaining. It's still really good to watch. Um, but the first time you're like, is this a game? Is she playing or is she really under control? Like what's happened? Because this series, it makes choices that aren't the conventional. I think like, the cliche ending of this is that she does get mind controlled and then her love for Trish breaks her out of it. Yeah. And they don't do that. And I'm really glad they didn't. They went for this more morally gray. Of, like she has to let Trish be in danger and not be a hero. Mm. Becomes an anti-hero essentially. Maybe yeah. that's where her line is. Maybe she doesn't get to be, like, Captain America. I always think it's funny when they bring up, like, the Avengers. They don't call them by name. At one point, they're like, the flag waver or the big green guy. (laughs) Because it's such a different world to, like, the Avengers films. Mm. Uh, I'm sure there's also stuff around, like, they probably can't I was wondering that. They do name drop Captain America in the later seasons. But they, yeah, I was wondering, like, do you deliberately just not talk about them? Yeah. I like that they can keep this a contained little slice of like the superhero world that isn't the world ending kind of stuff, but it's just like, what's it like for the people who yeah. just live their lives but have to deal with? There's some really interesting stuff in season three. It's not like at the forefront, but it's around the time that the Sokovia Accords are being passed, mm-hmm. which caused the events in Civil War. Mm-hmm. And there's a little bit more going into that in season three. Yeah. Which I thought was really interesting. I kind of wish, I think they've cancelled them all now, but I wish there was like one season set post Thanos snap. Mm. And we just get to see what it's like for the everyday people yeah. during those five years, during the blip. Because we don't really get it in Endgame. We get, it's just five years later and we get like hints of life and then mm. time heist. Time but I thought that would have made like a really interesting season of one of those shows, but not Iron yeah. Fist. I never watched <laughs> Don't watch. <laughs> Season two gets better. Okay. Sorry, Iron Fist. I just, they knocked it out of the park, like Daredevil, Jessica Jones, uh, Luke I, Cage. Uh, Luke Cage, I felt even sort of dropped the ball a little bit. Like, yeah. Uh, it's hard it to slow. talk. Jessica Jones season one, like for me, that is one of my favorite seasons of television for any show ever. Something I come back to and every time I'm like, ah, it's amazing. So good. So good. Yeah. So all of that to say, it's a cool grave. Is a very terrifying villain played by a beautiful man. <laughs> yes. Why don't we talk about our takeaways? All right. My takeaway is on running um, a terrifying villain. I think my number one thing here was to base it around a real life threat that we face. So this is really all about kind of this 1% of like these really entitled, powerful white men who have controlled the world for far too long. And then that's not only about like rape culture and how it affects women, it's about how it affects everyone who is not Mm. that 1%. I had, it's on the nose, but it's nuanced. It's very obvious what it's doing. Yeah, I wouldn't even say it's on the nose. Like I I think this series does a really good job of- It's not in your face, like Suffragette comes to mind. So if anyone remembers that movie, just very, very like men are bad and women are amazing. It's not a terrible movie, but like I said, like Jessica herself is very like a bit morally gray. Yeah. She's an alcoholic. Like we said, mm. she is a mess. She makes mistakes and it's much more fun. I had my notes, don't make her a Mary Sue and don't make your villain a cartoon. If you want to go see like a cartoon movie, a villain, go watch Kenneth Branagh in Tenant. I actually think Kenneth Branagh does a great job. Yeah. For that depiction of like an abusive man. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. If I can't have you, no one can. Like. Yeah. I, it, that's actually an interesting um, comparison on dealing with the issue of like mm. abusive men and abusive relationships and like. And that um, woman cat has like no agency. And yeah. then I would say like the protagonist of Tenant just coming for tenant sorry tenant um <laughs> it's like what will simpson's trying to be yeah of like i will rescue you and i will be the good cop and rise and up somehow with less depth than will simpson yeah he's the protagonist what else do you need to know <laughs> <laughs> like tenant was neither of us favorite movies which is a shame because it's one of the only movies we saw in theaters in 2020 yeah but we won't make a whole episode about that yes we uh, we only do movies and tv shows we like yeah yeah Try to be positive. Yes. Um, I think one of my takeaways, probably uh, two 
related takeaways. One of them is just around trying to find the villain that is right for your protagonist. And if you can find the villain that is right for all of your characters who can be a villain to all of them. Uh, and I think we talked about this in Thanos, right? Like that's another reason that Thanos is compelling as well is um, is similar to Tony Stark. And mm. They're both futurists and they both have a goal and like a vision for the world, but Thanos wants to yeah, or like kill everyone. He's kind of like a paladin, like Captain yeah. America is. Yeah. So they have those similarities, which is interesting to look at. Mm. And I think the other one would just be around how do you reveal your villains? So rather than having them just appear and monologue about how great they are or tell you how scary they are, let us see the reactions to them beforehand, right? Like, I think that's one of the reasons Kilgrave is so effective is not just because of his powers, not just because of how he uses them, and it's not just the performance or the way the thing is shot either. It's the fact that they do a slow reveal and piece by piece give us a taste of him until eventually, like, we are right there with him, watching him be chaotic. Like, he's kind of grasping for power at the end, and that's terrifying to watch because mm -hmm. of what we know he was like before that. Yeah, I also had in that, like, the more we see him and then his motive changes halfway through. Well, it doesn't change, mm -hmm. but what we think it is changes Yeah, halfway through, which is... I don't want to kill Jessica. I want to convince her to be with me. Hmm. Um, and then I had also just, this is a violent show. Oh, yeah. And the violence does get worse, but it's very like, like I wouldn't call it, say, like torture porn, like saw. It's very, because it's all unnecessary, I think. Yeah. Not not in like the show, but Kilgrave makes people do things that are mm. so over the top. Like there are so many things that come to mind, like mm. the scene with the hand in the blender or the, the scene. The body down the garbage disposal. Yeah, the guy with the pruning shears oh, yeah. that just like puts them in his mouth and drops onto them. It kind of makes you wince as yeah, you Yeah, and because it's people doing it to themselves. So yeah, I had, so keeping revealing like new motives so you never quite know what they're going to do, upping the violence, and then also making Kilgrave steadily more powerful. Yeah. And I think that's a really important one because it's one thing to have your protagonist start out as not strong mm. enough and get stronger so that they can beat the villain. It's another thing if your protagonist gets stronger and your villains get stronger. Like, and in this case, yeah. Jess doesn't get stronger, but Kilgrave, once he's out of the cell, he's getting stronger. And so it's this thing of like, oh, how do we, like Jess has to stop him before, uh, before he can control her basically. And that puts a real time crunch on this. And that's much more interesting than the other way around. And then you cast David Tennant. That's yeah. the most important bit. Look, it, even if you don't write it well, if you just cast David Tennant, you'll be okay. Uh -huh. that, that's our big lesson. <laughs> cast lesson. David cast Tennant. David Tennant. <laughs> now I want one of those like old school like Norbert films where one actor plays all the roles. And I want it to just be David Tennant. Amazing. Like 10 David Tennants. I remake Twilight. All David Tennant? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was our episode on Jessica Jones and how to create a terrifying villain. If you like the episode and want to hear more, make sure to hit that subscribe button and click the bell to receive notifications. We have upcoming episodes on films and TV shows such as Schitt's Creek, Uncut Gems, Middle Ditch and Schwartz, and The Matrix. Thanks for listening. Until next time, this has been Kill the Cat. We love you, David Tennant. I wonder if you, you listen to our podcast. He totally does. He to definitely does. Yeah, he's yeah. our number one fan. Number one fan. Uh, come on the show, David Tennant. We'll let you talk about anything. Yes. Uh <laughs>